So your program advertises a talk called God, Guns, and Grain, uh, and why global mental health needs to be adapted to Appalachia as a necessary cultural strategy. I'm detecting that this is more of a tech crowd than a cultural anthropology crowd. So what I'm going to do is retreat from some of that, go through six innovations uh, that is involved in my project, and then finish out by applying this to Appalachia. Hope this works for you. Um, so first of all, the most basic thing is I'm viewing Appalachia not just in the United States aggregate for the purposes of discussing mental health, but I'm comparing it to comparable regions elsewhere in the world that share some of the characteristics <coughs> that I've encoded behind those words, God, guns, and grain. Um, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains in New Mexico, for example, have similar patterns of addiction uh, and depression. Um, southern Apennines in Italy and in the Mani region of, of southern Greece also share the kind of honor culture that drives much of the cultural basis for mental illness. I'm using that in the Arthur Kleinman sense um, in the region. But the other big thing is I'm bringing the global mental health toolbox to bear on it. This I have to step back to explain. Um, when we th consider medicine in the context of the United States, and especially in a place like Cambridge, we're normally discussing it where we assume American middle class life as a kind of standard. We consider illness to be deviation from that standard that the patient considers painful or that has an economic cost. And so we're able to intervene in, for medical purposes, usually, if, if at all possible, on the molecular level. So in a medical school presentation of any ailment, typically they'll start with the patient's symptoms, they'll go to what's going wrong in the tissue, they'll explain how that relates to cells, and then finally, when they get to the molecular level, now we've got the truth. Now, to the extent that you can do this with mental health, it's much more limited. But even apart from that, there are, there's another problem, and that is that this causation, even in our own culture, and even with things like diabetes, we just got a great example of the extra five steps from Hussein. Um, it's all bound up with lifestyle. It's all bound up with, with beliefs that shape lifestyle. So, for example, if you want to address the issue of malaria in some cultures, it is very important to indeed have great medicine. But please remember to bring the malaria bring the mosquito nets as well, because you've got a wider context than just the medical context to address. Global mental health arose um, when Arthur Kleinman, a medical anthropologist here at Harvard, began to recognize that in the re replication of medical models around the world, in general, this had been overlooked. The global health course that actually I taught, took here explores on a case basis how, how throughout the world where people have looked at the entire causal web around illness transform strategies can actually be much more effective. So in, in the case of um, even ordinary medicine, never mind mental health, reconfiguration of the care force is often critical. You need to use professionals differently. You need to use non-professionals for things, and you need to work on the background culture of what people do and don't understand about illness. It's true of physical illness. It's even more true in many respects of mental illness. Another thing that's critical is to understand the social gradient and the cultural context. By social gradient, we mean that normally in the context of health, we've created an expert who stands at a higher level than an ordinary person. This communications gap is a difficult gap to cross, and especially in the honor-based cultures of the mountain regions of the world that I just finished discussing, where people are a little ornery or a little less interested in having someone from the outside tell them what's healthy and what's not. Um, apart from that, there's just cultural sensitivity. You have to understand the context within which people are living. I would, could say more, but as I say, I'm going to stick to the innovations here. Um, and finally, I think for me, it was critical to understand a strategy point that applies to a lot of entrepreneurial interventions, and that is diagonal approaches work much better than either vertical or horizontal when you're dealing, dealing with healthcare. That is to say, you can either work on a disease or a disorder, or you can try to deliver the entire foundational base for care. Smarter than either of those strategies is to pick just one intervention that has the possibility of gradually broadening over time so that you are choosing your entry point with some care and allowing the actual results to drive further performance. This has been done in a number of, of global health interventions. I would say, for contrast, you might say, in the country of Chile, maternal depression, which particularly matters to me, um, was done on a nationwide basis. It was a national campaign on just maternal depression, the vertical approach. In Nepal, people were trained to give sort of basic emotional support and other kinds of psychoeducation in remote areas that had no psychiatric help at all. Clearly, they're providing something more like a foundational approach. The smart thing compromises the two. Looking at ways of making a large difference on a regional basis means looking for something that replicates quickly. 
of the various kinds of things that have been attempted uh, that I studied, uh, of things that tried since the Second World War, therapeutic communities hit two areas that are critical for Appalachia. One of them, addiction, and the other one, trauma. Therapeutic communities are basically communities where people live as equals or coexist in some sense as equals. The concept of milieu care, of shaping an environment within which people interact with each other in ways that have therapeutic benefit um, has been stretched to include a number of things remote from that original definition. Um, an interesting intervention was where Russian orphanages were reformed in the, a few years ago because they had failed to take account of what attachment theory now tells us about the bond between caregivers and infants. Um, they actually, it was a, they were perfectly fine facilities from every material point of view. It's just that the Ministry of Health had required that the nurses that feed babies feed them in exactly 22 seconds so that they got enough babies fed. But, but the trouble is that we know that bonding is critical to ordinary intellectual development in infants. And so to some extent, just restructuring the way institutions interact with those in them uh, can be critical. At the other end of the lifespan is the HMP Grendon, um, a research prison in the United Kingdom, which has brought clinical psycho psychological tools to bear on trying to help inmates actually address the behavioral issues that got them into prison in the first place. Um, and finally, there's an intriguing example of some towns. Um, I would love to talk about Giel, but we won't have time. It's a town in Belgium that for several centuries has actually been known as a place particularly hospitable to persons with mental difficulties. Um, stigma is a difficult problem, particularly in Appalachia, places where the whole population has been well educated to handle mental illness without worrying about stigma, without being frightened of people who were different or strange, it would be a critical a, a logical extension of the milieu care concept. Um, this entails another perspective, which is the developmental perspective. If you think about it, um, psychiatric care and the clinical psychology based on that model has actually made a tremendous amount of progress in defining categories of human suffering that affect ordinary performance that are deviations from the norm. Um, the, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual 5 just came out a year ago, and it's huge compared to the original pamphlet uh, that was the first one back in the 1970s. On one hand, we're wonderful at, at diagnosing all the problems people have. However, the future appears to be a developmental perspective that looks at the way the mind and the brain in particular evolves through the lifespan. That lifespan perspective will change the way we deliver mental health care. It's important not just that places like Appalachia not be left out, but in fact, given the nature of the problems there, it should in fact lead the way. So a focus of the reforms I mentioned above should be to try to get onto the developmental model to the extent that you can do that. Um, again, paternal depression is the logical place to start if you're gonna do a diagonal strategy because you're right there at the very beginning of the lifespan. Whatever gets done should be evidence supported. That shouldn't be an innovation. That should be normal, but in fact it's not. Very few of the people who are actually now licensed in the United States to do mental health care are in fact following the evidence-supported methods that have been demonstrated by randomized controlled trials to be the ones that work. It's not that we don't have methods that work, but it tends to be the case that either they're not taught to use them or they find that they're dealing with so many comorbidities, difficult environments like, for example, Appalachia, that they don't deem it to be practical to do. So to actually go back and revisit this and, and revalidate this in ways that work for the setting would be critical to do. And for that, I have to interact a little bit with Shelley's earlier presentation. We can do more maybe in the Q&A. But the interesting thing is that, that to do that, you would have to actually look at the client compared with the client, him or herself, as the thing from simply being part of a group, which is what the randomized controlled trials do. You can do that. You, can, you do longitudinal studies. You use bio da biometric data collected, uh, perhaps with something like the kinds of devices the same was talking about. Um, you can make better use of single case studies and especially importantly do intensive longitudinal data, not just a few, do at least 10 and if possible more data points. Um, finally, this is also critical and this is coming more from the entrepreneurial community here in Cambridge than anywhere else and that is the people who are succeeding today are not writing a fat plan and trying to crank it out. What they're doing is relentless experimentation to see what works. By doing that, you build the whole nomothetic web within which your planned actions work fewer unintended consequences, things are more likely actually to work. And so finally, I think I'm coming up on my last minute, it has not escaped my notice um, that if you actually could do all this and you actually did have the data from exploration of the sort, you might not be badly situated to do a mental health insurance organization of some sort. I'm ready for your questions.
please raise your hand and I will be over with the microphone. It is an admitted fact that government expends a lot of money for physical care, mm -hmm. but they seem to squeeze the pen, if you will, when it comes to mental health care. Mm -hmm. We need to enlarge our vision. We need to enlarge the horizon that we need to take care of mental health mm -hmm. in a larger sphere because by protecting one's mental health, you, endate, you over time protect one's physical health mm -hmm. because when you are mentally healthy, then the physical will follow. But a person who is mentally sick, the physical will de decrease. We have the example of Stephen Hawking. Mm -hmm. He's physically ill, but his mind is strong. It's as a disease he heard, but in, in any sphere, if you can help a person with men, we need to expend more funds for mental health nationwide, even nation uh, in Massachusetts, but not just in Appalachia. Mm -hmm. I had a friend who had a, a, a bachelor's degree in, in chemistry for MIT. She suffered depression. She had a psychiatrist looking after her and doing everything. So one day I went to lunch with her and she came the next day and she said, I'm quitting. Two days later on the radio I heard she jumped off the BU bridge. I worked with her and she committed suicide. Right. She needed help, but she didn't get it. What was lacking? What did she need more? When you know someone personally, it has a greater effect on you. Right, right. Well, the Affordable Care Act does require mental health parity. It remains to be seen what that means. Um, as that act is implemented. But in any case, backing away from the law for a second, it's not even clear conceptually what that would mean. There's a lot of discussion about what is and is not mental health. Now, neurodegenerative disease is an entirely different animal, which you were describing with Stephen Hawkins. But certainly depression is involved. And, and of course, Matthew Nock here at Harvard is probably one of the leading researchers on suicide. So those sorts of things do get addressed with um, mental health resources typically. And yeah, I expect that na nationwide there should be some movement. The question is what will work I think a lot of that will have to be culturally contextual, and that's the basis of my project. Another question? Uh, okay, I, I hope I got this right. I want to ask you. Um, it sounds to me that what you're envisioning as being a really wonderful thing requires practitioners to rely on the developmental models but you, that you say they're not really using. So how would you propose to bridge that gap? Um, actually, the gap is a different gap. Thanks, that's a good question. Developmental approaches are taking over gradually. So it's not the case that they've turned their backs on the development that's already here. It isn't here. But what is the case is that in, when you look at the DSM and you follow the methods that are, that are generally prescribed in the profession, um, it, they only address one disorder at a time. So be, therapists who may not even have been trained in those methods are certainly not very interested in following them when they've got a, a client who's got multiple problems, particularly if they're coming out of the social work tradition where they are also licensed to provide mental health care. Um, what is better about the developmental model is it's better science. Uh, it's where the NIMH is going in, in its research funding. But it's also simply easier for, for clinicians to relate to. And so you would get higher compliance simply by working with that model anyway. What I particularly think that needs to be brought to the table in the case of Appalachia is an awareness of how Appalachian lives work, what sorts of conditions people live in, and that grows out of the global health perspective I mentioned earlier. Thank you. And this will be the last question for this panel. With the increasing nationalization of, of regulations and expectations, they've been allocating things to where the funding and the votes come from more. Mm -hmm. Appalachia has neither. How do you propose that we overcome this so you can actually apply what is needed more regionally rather than from a larger perspective nationally? Excuse me. I see a different problem from that one. The difficulty that I see is more like the VA scandal that we see going on now where what does reach the, the sort of the more remote and poorer regions of the country tends to be a centralized system. And so in, in order to manage properly, there is inevitably a, high, a fairly high degree of standardization. The trick is to get a kind of standardization that is, in fact, better tracking what's going on regionally. Now, that has been done in some places. The Inter Intermountain Healthcare, for example, out in Utah, has done a fairly decent job of, of showing how rural Utahns actually live and getting also holding doctors to protocols that work well, you know, on a consistent basis. Doing this with clinicians who work in mental health would be tricky because there's never been anything quite like that effort at standardization. Um, but I don't, at this point, see 
The difficulty is if you don't have a compelling enough regional vision of what mental health should look like, it's very hard to then have the vision for where the resources ought to go. So that's my basic answer to your question. It's like in terms of Appalachia, it's not even clear to people in rural Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, the southwestern part of Virginia, the western part of North Carolina, and uh, elsewhere, you know, even what, should, what the way it should look on the ground. I think it's important to do the research to find out. All right. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Mark.